Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for braving the cold and lack of water. I, I haven't done this in yeah a long time. I had to boil a pot of water this morning uh, and carry it upstairs to the bathtub and put it inside and then put cold water. And then, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, but I'm glad that you're here anyway, even despite all of that. Uh, my name is Bongani, uh, if you don't know me. Um, I'm married to Mulebo Kheng, my wife. She's not here because she's teaching the greenhouse class, but uh, we get the privilege of serving here in various ways. Uh, I'm also part of the, the eldership team of, uh, of Rooted Fellowship. Um, before we get into uh, the sermon for today, I really want to ask you to please get out your Bible. If you have a physical Bible, that would be great. If you have it in, on, your, on your phone, that's fine as well. I'm going to be using the CSB primarily, um, so please uh, you know, take that out. It'll be useful for you to be able to follow along uh, as I go through it. Um, let me pray uh, and dedicate this time uh, together uh, to the Lord, and then we can, uh, we can get into it. Um, dear Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we can yeah, just be here this morning as a, as a com community, as a congregation, uh, to be able to worship you in the way that we have this morning, Lord, is such a privilege. And now, Lord, as we hear your word, we pray, Lord, that you may be with us, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to be in this place. You're welcome in this place, O oh Lord. Um, work in our minds, uh, remove all distractions, help me, Lord, to speak clearly, and so that, Lord, we can be edified, uh, and that you can get the glory. And we pray all of this in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, so we, we are going to be in Psalm 51, okay, Psalm 51. That's where we're going to be this morning, um, and it's one of the few Psalms that are specifically pinpointed uh, out in terms of the historical, uh, you know, origin. If you look above your Bible that I've asked you to take out, it will contain the following words in whichever translation that you have. It will be something like this. For the choir master or the choir director, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And immediately when you read that, you should go, ah, I know that story. I've heard of that before. This is the story of David and Bathsheba that can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. Um, I'm not going to go and read all of that because that will be a sermon on its own, but I'm going to try and paraphrase uh, as much as I can, and some of it I'll, I'll read bits and pieces. But to give you an idea, because for you to really appreciate this, this psalm, you have to understand that context and have that in your mind. So in the spring, when the kings marched out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she has just been purifying herself from her uncleanness, and afterwards she returned home. Now, of course, as you would know, David is a man of God. He knows the law of God. You are not to commit adultery, but David just has to have her. And so he sends his people to go and fetch and bring her to him. And when they had brought her to him, he sleeps with her. Now, of course, nature takes its course. And after a while, Bathsheba sends word to David to tell him these chilling words, I am pregnant. Can you imagine? Uh, if, if you hear the words, I am pregnant, and you've immediately filled with fear, you're probably not in a marriage, a marriage relationship. <laughs> now, you would think that David's conscience would force him to come to grips with the error of his ways, but no. Like many of us do, David tries to manage his sin. Instead of re repenting, he thinks of a way in which he can, he can cover up his sin. And so David orders Joab and asks him to send Uriah the Hittite to him. When Uriah went to the palace, David asked him how the war was going, you know, just shooting the breeze, how things were going, how the troops. Afterwards, he said to Uriah, go to your house, wash your feet, go to bed with your wife. And what's the purpose of that? To try and cover up the sin. But Uriah, being a man of principle, didn't go into his house. He slept at the door of the palace with all the servants. And this is a big problem for David, right? And so he questions Uriah and says, haven't you just come from a long journey? Why didn't you go home? But Uriah replies, and essentially he says, my brothers are engaged in war and sleeping in the open field and in tents. How can I relax, wash my, sleep, uh, wash my feet, and sleep with my wife as if it's peacetime? 
Then David says to Uriah, stay here a little longer and tomorrow I will send you back. Then David invited Uriah to the palace to get him drunk and he gets him really drunk, thinking that yeah, when he's super drunk, he's going to forego his principles and go back into his house. But he doesn't. Uriah is still a man of principle and he still lies down at the doorstep. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab saying he wants Uriah killed. This is like escalating very quickly. And he instructs Joab to put Uriah where the fighting is the fiercest. And when he's surrounded, he asks them to pull back and leave him alone so that he can get killed. And of course, David's evil plan works and, and Uriah is killed in battle. Joab sent messengers, uh, to, messages to David to inform him of this news. And David's response was essentially, it happens. The sword devours who the sword devours. You know, it's like, it's war. What do you expect? People die in war. Are you surprised? When Uriah, Uriah's wife heard about the, her husband, um, that, it, that he had died, she mourned for him. And when the time of mourning had ended, David brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. However, the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. The Lord sends Nathan the prophet to David. And, 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 and Nathan tells him a parable. And in this parable, this parable is designed for David to essentially condemn himself. He says there are two men. One is super rich and one is, is very poor. The rich man has many flocks, various herds of various uh, you know, type of uh, animals, um, including lambs. And the poor man has only one lamb. And this lamb is like a daughter to him. It, it sleeps in his house. It eats and drinks from his, uh, his plate and, and, and cup. Um, you know, he treats it like his own family. And one day the rich man gets a, tra a, a traveler, someone to come and visit him. But for whatever reason, he doesn't have enough, um, doesn't have enough I suppose, sheep <laughs> in his own uh, uh, stock. So he goes and takes the sheep of the poor man and he slaughters that. And he gives that to the, to the traveler. And David arises in anger and he says, who is this man? This man deserves to be killed. He must pay back this lamb fourfold. And Nathan simply replies, you are the man. You are the man. Yes, yeah, so those are chilling words, man. You are the man. <laughs> Our sin always finds us out. Eh? God always finds out. Um, and David finally repents and says, I have sinned against the Lord. And this, this psalm is effectively what he composed to try and, you know, uh, you know relay what, it, what, you know, what his prayer was like when he repented. Sin has consequences, right? And Nathan proclaims many to David that we're not going to get, get into today. But one of them is that the child that Bathsheba has, had born would die. And that child did die. But astonishingly, Nathan responds to David and says, the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. I, I have so many questions, man. Like, this is a hectic story. Uh, I have a lot of questions. Um, I'm like, David, what were you thinking? Uh, you know, there's so many things I think, even in your family group, you could, you could explore, uh, you know, and, and dig a little bit deeper. I'll only ask two questions this morning. One is, how does David repent of this sin? I mean, you can imagine the, 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 the mindset that he must have been in as he was, you know, confronted with his sin and realizing that he's made a horrible, horrible mistake, and how does he take it back? The second thing that I think many of you uh, might also feel, because you almost feel this anger, right, to go, how can he get away with this? How does God remain just in forgiving David of this sin? I mean, what about Uriah? Where is justice for Uriah? Justice for Uriah. You know, like it's, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot. So how does God remain just in forgiving a sin like this? I mean, this is, this is gruesome. So let's start with the first question. How, do, how does David repent of this sin? And, and, this sin? and Psalm 51 is likely the most well-known of the, of the so-called penitential psalms. Uh, David composes this psalm after Nathan had confronted him for killing Uriah and, and essentially stealing his wife. This is David's personal prayer that he prayed when he repented from the sin that he had committed. And yet, even though it is David's personal prayer, it is also clearly meant to be a model for how the people of God should think and feel and act when they are confronted with their guilt and shame. You know what happens when you are confronted with your sin? You feel exposed. You feel 
seen, you feel naked, you feel just, you feel unworthy. And many of us turn to other things to hide our, our guilt and shame. We cover it up, we become secluded, we change our friendship circles. Slowly we start withdrawing from the community and unfortunately sometimes we even withdraw from the local church for good. This psalm offers an alternative way for how we ought to deal with the guilt and shame of the sin in our lives. David, instead of hiding his sin, composes it into a song. Can you imagine that? Eh? He composes it into a song. This is, the context around this is horrible. And yet he composes it to a song that a congregation can sing publicly. And this song is meant to be sung together. It is a song. David says, church, if God can forgive me after all I have done, then he can forgive you too. That's, That's what he's saying in composing this psalm. He says, join me as we sing the song of repentance together with my life as an example to showcase God's infinite mercy and grace and love. We just sang about that. And as you will discover later, this infinite mercy, grace, and love is found in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the, that's, the, that's the ultimate, if you don't get anything else from this psalm, this is what you're supposed to get this morning. And so this psalm is an invitation for us to think and to feel deeply about our sins. But instead of running away, it invites us to turn to God and ask Him for forgiveness and repentance. It invites us to turn back to our life of worship. Now, this psalm is a pretty simple uh, structure. Uh, verse 1 to 2 shows the basis in which uh, David can ask for forgiveness. Um, for the most you know, gruesome of sins, and that is on the basis of God's faithful love and abandoned compassion or mercy. Verse 3 to 6 details David's confession of his sin. 7 to 12 details the prayer that David prays for restoration. 13 to 17 anticipates a return to a life of worship that comes after repentance. And then verse 18 to 19 invites the entire congregation to live a lifestyle of repentance and worship for the flourishing of the whole, right? So that's, that's the simple structure. That's the last time you, probably, you will hear that uh, if you were taking notes, or if you want to take notes. All right, so the first thing that David does is he, he appeals to the faithful love and abundant compassion of God. Look at verse one. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. You see, David knows that the only way he can be forgiven is solely on the basis of God's love and compassion. He cannot appeal to God's justice because that would mean certain death. He cannot appeal to God's glory because God is the one who chooses which way he will have his glory. David appeals to God's faithful love and abundant compassion because he knows that is the only way he can be saved. David knows Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, because he quotes it later on in Psalm 103 and 145. He knows this. This is a promise that the Lord made to all of Israel, uh, it, it, to Moses uh, at Mount Sinai. And he says the following. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, iniquity rebellion, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequence of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. You see, David knows that there are those that are guilty who will have their sins forgiven according to the faithful love and abundant compassion of God. And yet he also knows that there are those who are guilty and will not be forgiven because they did not receive the faithful love and abandoned compassion of God. David is praying that he is part of the former and not the latter. You see, when you and I don't want God's justice, be careful what you, when you pray for that. You and I need God's faithful love and compassion. It is on the basis of God's faithful love and abundant compassion that David can ask, for the blotting away of his rebellion and guilt. Have a look at the second part of verse 1. It says, blot out my rebellion. Verse 9, uh, if you look further down where you are reading, it says, turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. You see, to blot out in this context means to completely wipe out or wipe away. Now, at first glance, verse 1b and, and, and 9b may look like David is simply repeating itself. 
But if you study the words carefully, you'll realize that one is referring to God wiping away the sinful act that David did, and the other is referring to not the act itself, but the character that this revealed through the act. When we sin, we are not just breaking a law or just transgressing. We are actually revealing that there's something deep within our character and our nature that is flawed. Ultimately, that is what needs to be wiped away in all of us. That is what must be restored. You see, the act of killing Uriah and stealing his wife, as gruesome as that is, is merely a symptom of a deeper corruption that is inside David. And unless God deals with that corruption, then David is still lost and corrupted by his sin. Church, a lesson for us here is to pray not only that God may forgive our transgressions, but that he may also work in our hearts to change us from the inside out. Unless God does that, we'll never be able to get better on our own. We are wholly dependent on him for the work of inward renewal. The second thing that David uh, appeals to the love and compassion of God for is that he may get cleansing or or washing. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7 says something similar. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Now, the terms wash and cleanse in verse 2 and verse 7 refer to the ceremonial system in the Old Testament. They refer to the rites or procedures that a person would have to undergo in order to cleanse themselves from uncleanness. It is the same with the hyssop which is a plant that they use to sprinkle water or blood as part of the ceremonial system for cleansing or atonement. In both cases, David is using these terms to refer to the inner condition that the ceremonies were pointing to. Have a look at the second thing that David does. He confesses his sin before the Lord. Verse 3 to 6 says the following. For I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. In verse 3, David confesses his sin, and he does not shy away from it. He doesn't make light of it. He says it is always on his mind. He doesn't make uh, light of it at all. He takes it with the seriousness that it deserves. In verse 4, he says something that may seem astonishing at first. He says, against you and you alone have I sinned. But what about Uriah? What about Bathsheba? Did he not sin against them also? Of course he did. Of course he did. What David is saying here is not the denial of his transgression against Uriah and Bathsheba. Rather, he is acknowledging that sin All sin is ultimately an attack on the lawgiver. When you and I sin, we are saying, God, I don't actually want you to be king of my life. I don't actually believe your laws are good for me. I know better. I know what is good for me. And ultimately, God, you do not. You are restricting me and stopping me from having what I want. You're stopping me from having fun. It's another common one we like to say. Don't be king of my life. I'll be the ruler of my life. That's what we're saying when we sin. You see, there's something deep within us, something that has corrupted our nature that makes us believe that we know how to run our lives better than God, the one who made us. And this leads David to confessing in verse 5 that he is indeed guilty from when he was born and sinful from the time he was conceived in his mother's womb. I can already hear a lot of you saying, what? What? Is going on here. So let's back up a little bit, right? Let's slow it down. Let's understand David's thought process. David is a man chosen by God to lead Israel and to redeem it. David has seen firsthand many miraculous signs performed by God. He knows the law of God. And yet, despite all of that, the same David stole the wife of a man, got her pregnant, and then the man killed to cover it up. This leads David to conclude his problem is not simply that he did not know the law, he knew it. But that despite knowing full well what is right and wrong, still proceeded to commit a terrible sin and showed very little remorse as he was doing it. If you go read 2 Samuel 11, you'll 
you, you will see that there is actually no sign at all that David felt any remorse for his actions as he was doing them. This leads David to the inescapable conclusion that his problem is not simply a behavioral issue, but it is a problem in his nature. And no, David doesn't just simply conclude that he was sinful from birth as if there was something wrong with him individually as a baby when he was born. Like his mother dropped him or something and then, you know, it took all this time for the crazies to come out. It's not like that. David concludes that he must have been conceived with a nature corrupted by sin, signifying that this is a problem not only with David, but with the entire human race, with all of us, with all of us. Theologians call this teaching original sin. To put it simply, the sin Adam and Eve uh, committed in the beginning affected the entire human race. Now, again, I can already hear some of you going, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. I wasn't there. <laughs> to that, I will simply respond, you don't want fair. Believe you me, you don't want fair with God. The Bible is the only book that effectively identifies and diagnoses the problem of sin in the world. And it tells us that it's in our nature. The Bible tells us the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. And it offers a solution. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Only he can change you from the inside out so that your nature is renewed. And if you don't want the solution the Bible offers to this problem, well, then I'm afraid you will get what is fair. And believe you me, you will not measure up. You will not, I cannot measure up. Let's be honest with ourselves. Be honest with yourself. Are you really as good as you think you are? Are you really as good as you think you are? Now, some of you may be tempted to go, yeah, I'm actually pretty good. Um, you know, well, maybe, perhaps, if you use my standards, if you use your friends, I mean, compared to who, right? Like, who are you good compared to? The world standards? If you've seen the Olympics, you've seen the world standards are not very high. I just, just putting it out there. What matters is God's standard, not ours. Will you be able to measure up in front of a holy and righteous God? That's the question. That is the question. David's conclusion is that he will not be able to measure up. He will not be able to measure up. Look at verse 6. It says, Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. David understands that a simple behavior change will not be sufficient in order to measure up before a holy and righteous God. God desires integrity. That word integrity also means truth. He desires truth in the inner self where he teaches us wisdom. But our inner self is corrupted by sin. That is why David moves his prayer to the next section, which is about the restoration of the inner man. Look at verse 7 to 12. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Verse 10 is the anchor verse for this section of his prayer. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David prays, create, create, O Lord, a clean heart for me. Some translations say, a clean heart within me, and renew a steadfast or right spirit within me. David is saying that unless you, God, recreate my heart and give me a steady and unwavering spirit, then I will not be able to truly repent. You see, God is the creator of the heavens and earth, and that same creative power that created everything is necessary for the recreation and restoration of the inner man. This is consistent with the promises God makes in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, where God promises to remove the, you know, the hearts of stone from his people and give them hearts of flesh, hearts that are pliable and receptive to his word. The Christian life, dear friends, is a life of repentance. In order to truly live a repentant lifestyle, then we need God's power within us to enable us to do so. 
Look at verse 11. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, I can already hear some of you saying, but why would David pray like this? Isn't he already a man of God filled with the, with the Spirit? Does this mean that Christians can lose their salvation? Now, you ought to be very careful to isolate verses like this and run away with your own conclusions. Any scripture belongs within a wider narrative that is not always easy to discern if you isolate it. In this context, commentators agree that David is praying that God may confirm that he indeed has the Holy Spirit within him. He's praying that he's not someone that has tasted the power of the Spirit and has been near it, but ultimately was never truly indwelt by the, by the Spirit of God that he was never truly saved. Now, someone may ask, well, is it okay for Christians to pray this prayer, that God will not take the Holy Spirit from them? And to that question, I would say Christians should be assured of their salvation. Our salvation is eternally secure in Jesus Christ and can never be taken away from us. Amen? Amen. But I think this prayer is helpful, especially in periods of great doubt about our salvation, perhaps because we have gone through a period of great sin and perhaps even abandonment of the faith. I think in those circumstances, it can be a helpful prayer. You'll be asking God whether or not you truly have been saved. In both cases, you're acknowledging that you cannot truly repent and turn away from your sins without God's power working in you to renew the inner man. You see, the same power that saved us when we first believed is the same power that is necessary for us to continue living as believers. Christianity is not an event. Uh, and I think we've, we've had this kind of culture creep into the church where we treat it as an event. Christianity is a lifestyle where we, we continually get sanctified day by day to become more and more like Jesus. If Christianity was an event for you and you see no fruit in your life and your lifestyle is inconsistent with that of a Christian, then I think you need to earnestly inquire of the Lord whether or not you are indeed saved. David's lifestyle in this particular uh, part of the scripture was not consistent with the man of God. And that's why I praise this prayer. My plea is that don't do that in isolation, but do that in the context of community. Come to us, come chat to the elders, come chat to the pastors of Rooted Fellowship. Let us walk that journey of repentance with you. Now you may be saying, okay, David, we get it. We ought to live a lifestyle of repentance, but that really sounds like a joyless and dreary lifestyle. I thought Christians were meant to be joyful. To that, David would probably say, look, living an unrepentant lifestyle is precisely what robs us of the joy of salvation. Look at verse 8. It says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have Christ rejoice. Look at verse 12. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. See, sin is a way of crushing our bones and sucking the joy out of our lives. Sin always hinders our view of our majestic Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just think of a time in your life when you are battling with sin, and all of us have been, you know, through this, if you're honest with yourself. And you just had no joy and energy about you. You had no desire to worship uh, the Lord and your Lord and Savior. His light in you and in your life grew strangely dim. I don't know about you, but when I'm going through that, I'm tempted to retreat and become very secluded. Uh, I tend to want to alienate myself from the church. Um, Honestly, man, if I didn't have people checking up on me, I probably would have, you know, gone through severe periods of depression and maybe even falling away from the church. But thank God, man, that there are people around us, people around us that can come to us and say, hey, I've noticed something. I've noticed a change. You're, You're a bit distant. You're not around as you used to be. What is going on? So people can help us to, to repent and come back into, into the church. You see, living a lifestyle of repentance ensures that we do not lose the joy of our salvation. That's precisely why it's there. Repentance is not this dry and dreary thing that we do because we just want to feel sorrow all the time. No, we do it precisely because we want to feel joy uh, and look at, look at our maker Uh, and rejoice and give him the glory. Look at the outcome that David anticipates. When God has recreated or restored the inner man, David anticipates that he will return to a lifestyle of worship. 
uh, verse 13 to 17, I'll read it for you. It says, Then I will teach the rebellious your ways, and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice is pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humble heart, God. Now, ultimately, this psalm is a prayer and an invitation for the individual and the congregation to return back to a life of genuine worship when we have repented. And the repentance that is genuine is based on the renewal of the inner man, not something external that we can do. To put it differently, the inward reality of our repentance and restoration flows out into external and public expressions of worship. Verse 16 and 17, 17 are the anchor of this section. When David says God, God does not want sacrifices or burnt offerings, he's talking about the mere physical performance of ceremonies or actions. David says God is not pleased with that. Instead, David says the correct way to worship God starts from a broken spirit and a humbled heart. It starts from the humility that destroys self-righteousness and relies ent entirely on God's power for the restoration of the inner man. That is what it means to have a broken and humbled heart. You see, the purpose of the Old Testament sacrificial system was never just about external rituals. It was, it was to point the worshiper to a deeper and for, more, more inward reality that God desires a worshiper who is a living sacrifice. Paul picks up on this idea in Romans 12, uh, verse 1, and, and Pastor Oni has already preached on that, so I would encourage you to go back and listen to that again. True repentance leads to a lifestyle of worship. Look at verse, th verse 13. It will lead us to worship God by teaching the rebellious, and sinners his way so that we may, they may return to him also. You won't be able to, you know, just keep it to yourself. Yeah. When you've experienced the mercy of God, you just have to spread it out. You have to shout it out. Yeah. Look at uh, the second part of verse 14. We will worship God by singing of his righteousness. Because we've seen it firsthand. Look at verse 15. We will declare his praises publicly. The point here is that the inward reality of our restoration will find its way into every area of our life. We will declare of the faithful love and abundant compassion of this faithful God and want others to experience the same love too. Lastly, the whole congregation will prosper when, you know, when we all practice a lifestyle of repentance. Uh, look at, look at uh, verse 18 to 19. If in your good pleasure... Cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices. Whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This psalm closes by showing us the relationship between our own individual spiritual health and that of the congregation. Our spiritual health as a member of the body of Christ and of the local church absolutely matters. It absolutely matters. It will either add or subtract from the health and prosperity of the whole body. It will impact, whether negatively or positively, on our ability as a congregation to worship God correctly. Your spiritual health matters. Your spiritual health matters. It's not your own private matter. You know, this is another kind of fallacy that has made its way into the church to go, my spiritual health is, is a private, personal matter. It is not. It affects all of us. It affects all of us as a congregation. That is why here at Roots that we continually remind all of us that we were not made to live in isolation. And this could be not, it couldn't be more true when it comes to matters of spiritual health. When you just go AWOL and disappear, right? and I'm kind of speaking from experience, when you just go AWOL and disappear and you never show up to church and you don't respond when anyone contacts you, that affects us. It affects all of us. It affects all of us. You see, the church is a community of worshipers. And for us to be true worshipers of God, we need true inward restoration of the inner man as a community. We need each other to remind ourselves of that and to spur one another on and to help one another to repent when we fall. So church, your spiritual health absolutely matters, not your own private thing. And that's why we always say, reach out to someone. 
Talk about it. Don't suffer in silence. Because you may think it's just you. It affects all of us. It affects all of us. The quality of our worship is affected by your own spiritual health. Our ability to the church to reach out is affected by your spiritual health. We are not made to live in isolation. We are made to live together. And when we live a lifestyle of repentance together, God says that is when we will prosper as a community. Now, I want to bring the, the band up uh, as I try and, and wrap this up and answer the second question um, that, that I posed at the beginning, which is, how can God simply forgive David's sin? You know, how can he just simply, simply do that? In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, um, David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This is when David repented of the sin that he had committed. And then Nathan replied to David, and the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. Now, the words taken away can be more directly translated to passed over. So the Lord simply passed over David's sin. But how can that be? How can he simply just overlook them? How can God just pass over David's sin? One verse I didn't touch on is in, in our text is, is verse 4. The second part of verse 4 says the following. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. How can David so confidently pray so that you are right when you pass sentence and blameless when you judge. How can God forgive David of this sin whilst remaining just and righteous? How is that possible? You see, if it is indeed possible for God to forgive sinners of their sins while remaining just, then this is the best news in all of the world. The Apostle Paul picks up on this in Romans chapter 3, verse 25 to 26, and I want to read it uh, to you. God presented him, that is Jesus, as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, and that word restraint can also be translated forbearance. So in God's divine forbearance, God passed over, exact same word as used in 2 Samuel, the sins previously committed. God presented him, that is Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he, will not, he, would, he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. I remember the first time when I, I had a Bible study, it was on 2004. I can't remember whether it was just before I became a Christian or, or, or just after, but it was, it was somewhere around that time. And our Bible study leader was giving us this image of, of, of God carrying this large sack. You know, because to forbear, to forbear is exactly that, right? It's, to, it's almost like you're carrying this large thing and you're walking with it. And inside of that, is the penalty for all of our sins. And God is saying it is possible for David to be forgiven because God was carrying all of that on his back. He was forbearing with David's sin. All of the sins of all those who believed in the Old Testament, God was carrying like this. And what did he do? He poured the just penalty for all of their, their, their sins on Jesus at that point in time. This is how God can forgive David and pass over his sin while still remaining just and righteous. You see, David's sin didn't sit unpunished. It was. This is how God can forgive me of my sins and remain just and righteous. I'm not a good person in the sense that if you look at my inner man, you'd find very scary things. But how can God look at me and go, yes, Bongani, you are righteous. I have justified you. It's because God was carrying my sins. And at the moment when I believed, he said, the just penalty for your sins will be paid by Jesus on the cross. That is how God can forgive you of your sins and remain just and righteous. You see, it is all about the superiority of the work of Christ on the cross over and above all of the sins you have ever committed in your life. That is what it's about. Um, I think Pastor Owner likes to say it this way, that there is more grace in Jesus than, Jesus than there is sin in you. And that's no more true than in a psalm like this. 
when we have committed the most gruesome of sins and we have just fallen away, we have to remember that there's more grace in Jesus than there is, there is sin in our lives. That is how God can remain just in forgiving any of us. It is because the just penalty for our sins has been paid for on the cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now church, I know in a, in a room like this, there'll be many people uh, you know, in different circumstances and situations. Uh, and maybe some of you have been, you know, maybe you realize that you've been living an unrepentant lifestyle. That you know you're a child of God, but if you look at your lifestyle, it's not been consistent with that of a Christian. And I think it's always useful to do an evaluation of where we are with that. But I think this morning, this morning, I want to remind all of us that there's mercy, there's grace, there's faithful love, there's compassion uh, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God is so patient. God is so patient. You know, the word forbearance for me, it reminds me of a very patient person. Very patient person. God is so patient. There's still time. If you're hearing this message this morning, there's still time. You need to come to Him and plead like David did for for repentance and renew all of your inner man. And if you don't know Jesus at all, then there's good news. God is still patiently waiting for you to repent. You know, God is still carrying that sack full of your sins. The penalty for your sin can only be paid for in only one of two ways. It's either you pay for it yourself or Jesus takes the penalty for your sins on your behalf. And church, this morning I'm praying that you choose Jesus. None of us can measure up. You you cannot take the penalty for your sins on yourself. It will take an eternity to pay that back. It will take an eternity to pay that back. So I'm praying this morning that you choose Jesus. Whether you know Him or not, choose Jesus so that you can repent for the first time. And if you do know Him, choose Jesus so that you can continue to live a lifestyle of repentance and you can be restored back to a life of worship. Lord Jesus, we we come before you um, you once again this morning and we're so thankful, Lord, for the the work that you've done on the cross. The work that you've done on the cross, Lord, is indeed the pinnacle of history. It is what all of the patriarchs and the kings in the Old Testament were looking forward to. And it's what all of us, after your death on the cross, are looking back to for our salvation. It is the pinnacle of history where we see your justice and we see your mercy. Where we see your wrath, but we equally see your love. Lord, we are so thankful for the work that you've done on the cross. And we're praying this morning, Holy Spirit, that you may apply it to our lives, apply it to our minds and our hearts. Help us, Lord, to grasp onto that. Help all of those, Lord, that are battered and bruised by their sin to come to you, Lord, in repentance. Have an attitude of repentance. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you may give us that power to enable us to do so. We also pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here, Lord, that doesn't know you, that you may work in their hearts, that they may realize that they need to give up their entire lives to you so that you can renew their inner man. We thank you, Lord, for this great gift that you have secured for us on the cross. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen.